to Shoreline Theater presents Creature Feature, our exploration of the creatures that live deep within us. Horrifying? Terrifying? That depends on what lives inside of you. Whoa, whoa, whoa. I'm gonna, I'm gonna need you. That's, that's a little intense. I'm gonna need you to dial that back just a little bit. Oh, okay. Uh, all right. Horrifying? Uh, terrifying? Well, that depends on what lives inside of you. So enjoy, enjoy, enjoy. My name is Graham Cowgill. Um, glad to be back. Um, if you were here last week, it was so nice to have Pastor Eric back back from the land of the littles to come in here and talk for a little bit. Uh, so the, we're in the Creature Features, our series. Uh, it's just a way to have some fun. But what we're also talking about is kind of these creatures that live deep within us, that sometimes we know they're there, sometimes we don't know they're there. And the movie that Pastor Eric used last week was the movie The Birds. And so the movie that we're using this week is The Invasion of the Body Snatchers. And if you've never seen the original movie, The Invasion of the Body Snatchers, you're not missing much. Uh, <laughs> I went back and watched a little bit of it, and I was like, this is it? How does this even get famous? Uh, in fact, this visual is a million times more terrifying than anything in the movie. But here's kind of the synopsis of the movie. In the movie, there's this little town, and there's like an alien invasion in the town. And what happens is when you're asleep, then the alien, the way it'll invade is create this pod around you and kind of create this mold of who you are. Now that mold, that person who's out there, uh, it's the imposter version of you. It's not really you. And they're totally void of emotion and just going through, going through life, not really reacting. But that's how the aliens invade. I just want to throw that out there to say, don't rush out and see it, but it's going to serve, serve this morning pretty well. All right. Let me first off start with a question here. Anybody here ever had their uh, car broken into? Show of hands. It's crazy, isn't it? Um, when we were in California, our apartments that we lived in, every apartment had their designated parking spots down below. And so one morning I had to wake up early because I had to go take somebody to the airport. And I go down there and our car was not in the parking spot. And so I just thought, oh, I lost our car because if you know me, that's not beyond the realm of possibility. I lose everything always, right? Uh, but there's a little broken glass there on the ground. So by the powers of detection, I thought, I think something's happened to the car. So you know what I mean? I'm good at this stuff, man, I'm telling you. So we call the cops, they come, we file this police report, which is just so emasculating. Because they're like, I don't know anything about cars. And they're like, what's the make of the car? And I was like, the make, the make. And then Kristen would answer. And I'd be like, oh. They'd be like, what year? And I'm like, Kristen. And then so eventually they're like, hey, go do something. Let me talk to your wife. I was like, cool, no problem. But anyway, they filed the police report. A few days later, uh, they give us a call. And they say, hey, we found your car. Uh, actually, this woman and her boyfriend had stolen it, and they went on this rampage around the city stealing mail out of people's mailboxes. Then it got in a high-speed car chase with the cops, ramped over some uh, train tracks and into a tree. I remember thinking, that is awesome. <laughs> like... Nobody wants their car stolen, but if it gets stolen, that's what you want, right? You don't want them to find it like parked outside of a library. You want, that's sweet, man. You want some meat to this thing. And so the fact that it was probably in a Jason Statham movie, I'm like, way to go, expedition, right? You did it. Uh, then we got it back, and of course, the upholstery is destroyed, and the tires are all ruined, and whatever exists under a car. <laughs> you can ask Kristen. <laughs> All that's ruined. Um, but it was good because the insurance company gave us $12. So that was all, that was all really cool. Um, usually with that stuff, and this is probably not even healthy, but usually with that stuff, I am eerily okay with it. 
I'm always like, eh, whatever, man. Yeah, over the train track sounds good, right? <laughs> it is what it is. That's just, that's, I'm, I'm very even keel. But when it came to that one in particular, for some reason, it was a little bit unnerving. And I'm talking about people breaking into cars, but maybe you're in here and somebody's broken into your home before. Anybody had that? There's something very violating about that feeling. You know, it's, it, is, it is such an unnatural feeling where all of a sudden something that was taking zero brain space in your life is now taking a lot of brain space. I never thought about safety before. I never thought that this was a possibility. And now do I have to think about that? Do I actually have to use emotion and brain space? And it feels unnatural. It feels violating because there's been this invader. There's been an imposter and especially you've had a home broken in just to think there's somebody who's been in here who wasn't supposed to be in here. Like you, you, you can feel that there's something unnatural. In scripture, in the Bible, uh, they actually describe sin as an invader, as an imposter. What it says in the Bible is that the way that we are created is to enjoy a pure intimacy with God. But the invader of sin, essentially what it does is it encapsulates us, it ostracizes us, it separates us from our life source, and that sin is the invader. The reason that now, as humans, we are inclined to sin But you guys know as well as I do that when you're in the throes of sin, there's something that feels unnerving, unnatural, that doesn't feel fulfilling. It doesn't feel like it was a part of the original design, and that's because it wasn't. Sin was never a part of the original design. Sin was never a part of the original equation. God had created us to enjoy him intimately, perfectly, purely, with no obstacles between us. But but sin as the thief as the robber, as the thing that came to kill and destroy the fulfillment that God has for us existed. And because of that, we feel like we're in this pod separated from our life source. Here's how Ephesians 2 verse 1 says it. It says, at one time you were dead because of your sins. At one time, all of us lived to please our old selves. We gave in to what our bodies and minds wanted We were sinful from birth like all other people and would suffer from the anger of God. Now, you know, how did sin get here? Here's how sin got here. God very intentionally and very beautifully created us with free will. Here's what that means. And that means that when you worship God, when you praise God, that you get to choose to do that. You're choosing to worship him. When we surrender to God, we choose to surrender to God. Now, that's beautiful. But also what comes with that is that we can also choose to rebel against God. That's what sin is. Sin is essentially us choosing to rebel against God. It is an inward independence from him. Right? It is, it is essentially the things, now how does that manifest in our life? All sorts of different ways. In, in what we say, in what we think, in what we do, but ultimately it's saying, hey, I'm gonna choose myself over you, God. Inside of this moment, I'm going to decide what to do. And here's what's just so insane, is that when we're rebelling against God, and we know this after the fact, is we are rebelling against what is best for us. God never wants to keep you under his thumb or make sure that you don't have fun in this life. It's the exact opposite. God knows because he created you with the most life-giving thing in your life. He wants to ignite that in your life. And so many times we go, no, 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 I think we know better than you, God, about what's good for us. And we felt that uh, afterwards. Sin, that word actually is uh, the original word. It's an archery term. Um, sin literally means to miss the mark. Uh, so in archery, you have the, the, the bullseye, the center of the bullseye, and sin is the distance away from the center of the bullseye. It's how far you're missing the mark. Now, here's the deal. 
especially when we're talking about sin and the way that we're created in our response to who God is and our relationship with God, who chooses the mark, right? Who chooses the mark? Because a lot of times we feel like our feelings choose the mark, society chooses the mark, uh, our logic chooses the mark. Maybe um, how good we are compared to other people chooses the mark. But actually, there's only one person who chooses the mark, and that's God. And somebody came to me the other day and said, hey, Graham, how, do you, uh, how can I get to heaven? And I said, well, here's how. You gotta be perfect. <laughs> like, not pretty good. Perfect. The mark is Perfection. It's not pretty good. It's not, hey, I want to try to be really good with my life. Come on, God, you know me. I'm a good person. And yeah, I've screwed up, but I re- no, that's the mark is perfection. And here's the good news either way you look at it, is that every single one of us, every single one of us has missed the mark. There is not one per, it's not a better than or less than. We've said this before. There's two boxes that you check. It's either perfect or imperfect. And every person who has ever walked the earth except for Jesus has checked imperfect. One of my favorite verses, which is a really weird favorite verse, but it's Romans 3.23. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The re- I know that's a weird verse, but the reason, <laughs> or weird favorite verse, the reason it's one of my favorite verses is because I can't think of a more unifying verse than that. That verse eradicates elitism. You, you, can't, you can't just think I'm better than somebody. If you're in here, by the way, and you just think that you are better than another demographic of people, whatever them is to you, and you think that you're better than they are, read this verse. (laughs) Memorize this verse. If you're in here and you think that you've been given up on or that there's no way you could ever be used by God, read this verse, right? Memorize this verse. Because it, it applies to every single one of us. We all check that box. How do you get to heaven? You, you have to be perfect. Now, I don't have to convince anybody here that sin exists. I'm, I'm just betting. And I probably don't even need to convince anybody in here of the effects of sin. Everybody has felt it, right? You feel that thing. Um, I'm not even sure if it still exists. Somebody in the first service thought that it did. That all-you-can-eat hibachi and sushi restaurant, is that thing still there? That's unbelievable that that thing is still there. It was gross 15 years ago. Maybe it's great now, but 15 years ago, I don't know if we were married or if we were still dating, Chris and I, but we went on a date there, (laughs) which now that I say that out loud is super unimpressive. I hope it wasn't our anniversary. Uh, But we went there, and so we're looking at this menu, and they say, hey, all you can eat, sushi and hibachi, for like $21 or something. I was like, bring it on, right? So we both got that, and the waiter uh, comes over, and I go, dude, all you can eat, bring me one through nine and two of ten, right? Just like start loading up. So they're just bringing out so much food, it's obscene, just waiting pools full of fried rice, right? So I'm bathing in the fried rice and eating it and just shoveling it down my throat, and then they bring out these two sushi rolls, and I'm kind of full, but, you know, I want to do my due diligence, so we eat those things. Well, all of a sudden, this little old lady comes from the back room, and she was old, y'all. I, I, don't, I don't want to exaggerate, but let's say she was 300 years old, probably. That's still probably under, the oldest person you've ever seen in your life. She comes over to our table, and she goes, uh, hey, everything that you don't finish, you have to pay for. And as soon as she said that, the waiter comes over with five more sushi rolls, and I was like, Okay, so, you know, I'm Googling, like, how many times can a human give plasma in one day, right? And Kristen's getting ready to wash dishes. And then we have this, like, idea, and this is not my coolest moment, okay? <laughs> don't, don't just sit there in your chairs and judge me. How dare you? Kristen and I took turns taking handfuls of sushi to the bathroom and flushing them down the toilet. <laughs> Not proud of that, okay? It's not like the coolest thing I've ever done. However, my kids are going to college and they wouldn't have had I had to pay for all that food. So maybe it kind of worked out. 
here's the point. When I was eating the food, everything was good. We're good, it's a great date night, great anniversary, whatever. And then all of a sudden, like reality sets in, you're met with the bill and that's what it feels like. That to me is what sin feels like. The enemy is able to package sin and uh, the enemy is smart. He can package, of course, is sin fun? you darn right it's fun. Like the, the enemy wouldn't have a game if sin wasn't fun when you're in the middle of it. But what happens? As soon as it's done, as soon as kind of you can see clearly again, then you get the bill. And when you get the bill, everybody has the same reaction and it's, oh my gosh, that was not worth it. Oh, I wish I could take that back. And who knows when you get the bill? Maybe you have that clarity right after it happens and you just go, God, what am I doing, dude? That is not worth it. Maybe you get the bill the next morning. Hello, right? Maybe uh, you just keep putting the meal on your tab and you just keep saying, nope, put it on my tab, put it on my tab, put it on my tab. And then a year later or two years later, it's time to settle the bill and you absolutely capsize your life, right? Here's how Romans 6.23 phrases it. It says, for the wages of sin, what you earn for sin is death. And that's not talking physical death. It is talking about a separation from your life source. It is talking about you get in this place where you begin to self-define. You self-define not only on what you've done, but the ruler of your life is the sin, the thing that is separating you from a good God. It is the thief. It is the robber. And it's, honestly, it's pretty much taking from us the true life that God desires. Here's what I love. But, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Here's what Ephesians 2 says. It keeps going. But God, which I just love that when God butts in, right? Had so much loving kindness. He loved us with such a great love, even when we were dead because of our sins. He made us alive by what Christ did for us. You have been saved from the punishment of sin by his loving favor. God raised us up from death when he raised up Christ Jesus. He has given us a place with Christ in the heavens. He did this to show us through all the time to come the great riches of his loving favor. He has shown us his kindness through Christ Jesus. Listen to this next part. This is for you. If you're in here and you've ever asked, how do I get to heaven? The answer, unfortunately, is be perfect. But guess what? You can't do that. I can't do that. We can't do that. God knew that. He was unwilling to leave us in a pod separated from him. So because of that, for by his loving favor, you have been saved from the punishment of sin through faith. It is not by anything you've done. It's a gift of God. It is not given to you because you worked for it. If you could work for it, you would be proud. But we are his work. He has made us to belong to Christ Jesus so we can work for him. He planned that we should do this. So every one of us, every single person in here has been invaded. Our body was snatched and, and for a time, we were the imposter walking around, void of emotion, void of life. God was unwilling to leave us there. You know, I talked to a dad one time whose son uh, was serving, was it life or right under life, uh, in prison. And this dad was trying to reconcile visiting his son in prison because he just couldn't stand being there at the prison and there being that glass between them. And he's like, I can't see my son and not be able to hold him. Like, I can't take that. When we talk about a life of freedom in here, you need to know that what God desires for you is the most pure, intimate relationship with you that he's created you for. He is unwilling to do that. The reason that Jesus died for us on the cross, willingly, was crucified was because our father says, I can't stand for there to be a, a, a glass wall between us. I have to embrace you. I want you to know me as your heavenly father. It is to eradicate what sin has done in our life. This is maybe just what Graham's going through this week. So maybe I'm just projecting this on you, sorry. But I am afraid that maybe 
that realization of what Jesus has done and the breaking out of the pod, us asking for forgiveness, which to get out of the pod, if you're here for the first time ever and you go, what does it look like to be a Christian? Uh, what does it look like to, to do this thing, to be adopted in the family of God? All it looks like is for you, because the verse just said, you can't do it by yourself. You can't pry that pod open by yourself. Now, the only thing that you can do is to say, I choose that free gift of forgiveness. Father, I, I, I want to be defined by your forgiveness. And here's, here's what I worry, because it's happened in my life, is that the severity of that miracle, the beauty of what God has done for us, and the freedom that he offers us, sometimes it just becomes a talking point. Sometimes it just becomes mundane. Sometimes we just think, oh, being a Christian, what does that mean? It means I throw a fish on my car, maybe I'll wear a Christian t-shirt, and yeah, I mean, it's pretty cool, but you know, it's whatever. My life looks like everybody else's. I just, you know, I can't go anywhere Sunday morning, right? That's, that's what being a Christian is. And I'm wondering, because I'm evaluating this in my own life, are we actually embracing the miracle of salvation in our lives? Are there areas of our life that have fallen back into the imposter, void of emotion side that God is wanting to break you out of? You ever seen The Matrix? There's a scene in The Matrix where he gets unplugged and he wakes up and he goes, oh, and he says, my eyes hurt. And the guy in Morpheus goes, it's because you've never used them before. Do we see differently? Are our vision, is our vision changed? Are our goals and dreams and passions changed? If we were void of emotion, like, it's not just, eh, whatever, it's not that big of a deal. There's a big difference between me walking and operating in freedom and being stuck in that pod. Does our passion reflect that? For me, does my passion reflect that? I, if I can now feel, if I am enjoying this relationship that God has, I want to grieve deeper. I can feel deeply. I, I want to grieve. I want to love deeper. I want to celebrate deeper. I want things to be different. I want somebody to look at my life and say, there's a big difference, Graham, between you here and in there. It matters. Is salvation permeating into every area of our life? Maybe there's some areas that um, to be totally honest, we're, we're a little bit asleep in. This brings us to our next, next little section. Uh, anybody here wet the bed till pretty late in life? Is that like the worst crowd participation question of all time? <laughs> oh, man. Somebody between services is like, oh, I did. I was like, well, thanks for raising your hand, man. I was up there on the stage by myself. So... Um, I'm not sure the exact age. Actually, my mom sometimes watches online. Mom, if you're watching online, I know this is weird. Sorry, I haven't called you in a while. Could you uh, just type in the comments how late I wet the bed till? Because I think it was 13, but that sounds radical to me. So love you, mom. Let's liven that chat up online a little bit. Throw that in there. Anyway, point is, uh, wet the bed till pretty late. Not the coolest thing. I, I get that. Uh, but I also had a habit of sleepwalking which is about the worst combo you can imagine. Um, and by the way, if you're thinking this is inappropriate, Pastor Eric ate out of a diaper last week, okay? So I'm, I'm good here. I, anyway, uh, so one night my mom's up in her room and she, you know, arose to such a clatter and there was a commotion downstairs and she heard that there was running water in the bathroom or in the um, kitchen. So she came down flipped on the light. It, in fact, was not running water, but it was her oldest son who had sleepwalked into the kitchen and was peeing in the pantry. <laughs> just all over the cereal, just like ruining lives. And so my mom, you know, had to like position herself behind me and like guide me into the bathroom while I'm just going to the bathroom all over the house. <laughs> not, the cool, not the coolest thing. This isn't like confession time. This is leading somewhere, <laughs> somewhere I promise. Here's the point. Do you know why I peed in the pantry? Two reasons. One is I was out of it, okay? Let me just throw that. That's not like my thing, okay? <laughs> I was out of it. I was not alert. I was asleep. 
But the second reason why I peed in the pantry was it felt good, which I know is weird, but it feels good to go to the bathroom. It feels even better to go to the bathroom in the pantry. Sounds strange, but don't knock it till you've tried it. I'm just saying some of you guys grab some cereal on your ride home, have yourselves a night. It's not that bad. I also want to say this. Every regrettable thing that you've been involved in in your life, here's my guess, here's my prediction. Everything that you've been in that you go, well, that wasn't good. Or every relationship that you've been in that you go, uh, boy, I really wish I could have the last week over or the last month over, or the last year over, or the last five years over. Every habit that you have um, found yourself in, every self-destructive pattern, uh, everything that you have found yourself in that casing separated from your life source, quite honestly, are probably because of one of those two reasons. Either you were not alert, or you were chasing what felt good. I mean, think back. Think back over those decisions. So many times we are just not alert. So many times we're focused on the wrong thing. We're just going through life. Anybody here ever had a relationship that you were in and everybody around you goes, don't be in that relationship. It's not a good thing. And in fact, you find yourself so intent on proving those people wrong that you never actually ask if it's good for you at all. Then you get six months down the road and you go, what was I thinking, right? Or maybe you're in here and you're in here. Sorry. Uh, maybe this morning you're thinking to yourself about those areas of, of pain that you cover up with comfort and you know where it leads and you know in another week how you're gonna feel and you know that it feels unnatural, but you know what? The way that you pave over it with eating, that's, that's predictable. I, I, I know that. It feels good in the moment. I'll deal with the bill in a little bit. Or yeah, I know that it's, it's drinking. I know that that numbs it. And, but right now, that's what I need because I need the pain to be away. Or maybe you're chasing after that thing that just feels good. And not only that, society has actually affirmed that journey for you. Society has said, if it feels good, then you're on the right track. That's all there is in life, is to chase after the things that are good. And so we find ourselves not alert. We find ourselves chasing what is good. And so here's a beautiful verse for us. It's Ephesians 5, 14 through 17. And this is such a great, a great verse. By the way, in church, just so you guys know, when we come together, it's not like, Let's show up on Sunday, hear some tall guy talk about peen, and then bail for a week, right? What are we here to do? We are here to walk alongside each other. Like, we care about applying this. We care about our life being different. You can watch a message anywhere. That's not what church is. Church is about putting your arm around somebody and saying, hey, where, where can we grow? So here's our verse that we get to say to each other. We want to leave this place different, not check in once a week. Ephesians 5, 14 through 17 says, For the light makes everything visible. This is why it is said, Awake, O sleeper, rise up from the dead, and Christ will give you light. Awake, O sleeper. How does Graham say that? Stop peeing in the pantry. Stop peeing in the pantry. Awake. Where are the areas that you are not alert? Where are the areas that you are just chasing what feels good? You know, I was trying to think, what's a good question for us as we live this next week for us to realize the areas that we are peeing in the pantry, that we are not alert, that we are sleepwalking? You know what I thought? Because a lot of, a lot of us, we won't even realize it until our therapist asks us that one question and you go, geez, I never thought about that. And then you realize that you haven't thought about that your entire life and there's room for growth. So how do we do that? How can we ask each other a question or how can we ask God a question? And here's what it is. If you got paper, write it down, write it down in your phone. This is a great car question on the drive home today. Or when you're tonight looking at the mirror, ask the reflection this. God, show me how I can grow as a fill in the blank. Or God, show me how I can grow in my fill-in-the-blank. 
Now, what we're not saying is how can I be better? Because a lot of times if we say be better, we, we tend to white knuckle that stuff. And we say, okay, I can get as close to perfect as possible. That's not what the goal is. The goal is for you to be lockstep with your heavenly father that we are breaking out of the casing and that every aspect of our life that God is saying, if there's any obstacle between you and me, I want you to die to that and I want you to be connected. So when we ask this question and I say, all right, God, show me how I can grow as a father. Then I stop and God speaks to me and he highlights my nights that I just sit in front of the TV instead of being with my kiddos. He highlights the areas of comfort over sacrifice. He highlights the times that I just say, go put yourself to bed and I don't pray with my kids. And it's not shame, it's not shame, it's the exact opposite. God wants fulfilling life for me. So we get to ask, how, God, how can I, not out of shame, out of opportunity, God, how can I grow? How can I invite you into being a father or a mother? God, show me how I can grow as a husband or as a wife. God, show me how I can grow as a boss. You don't want another five years to go by and you don't think about inviting God into that area of your life. God, show me how I can grow in my rest. I don't want my rest to be time away from God. I want to invite God into that. He knows how to give me fulfilling rest. God, show me how I can grow in my play, in my hobbies. Show me how I can grow in my humility. Show me how I can grow in my patience. We start to look at the different areas of our life. We realize that God says, I died not just so that you could be forgiven. Listen to this. Not so just you could be forgiven, but so that you could feel forgiven. Do you feel forgiven? Because if you are not dying to shame, if you're not feeling forgiven, what you're doing is you are crawling back in this pod. There's two ways to get in the pod. The first way, we are all born in the pod because of the sin that we have in our life. We have all chosen rebellion. Romans 3.23 says every single one of us was in the pod and there's nothing we could do to save ourselves. You are not perfect. I am not perfect. We are not perfect. But when we ask for forgiveness and God breaks us out of the pod, then a lot of us, for some reason, maybe it's because even if it's uncomfortable, we like the pain that we know, we crawl back in there. God is going, what are you doing? I broke you out of there. I broke you out so that you could live life abundant. Come alive. Awake, oh sleeper, stop peeing in the pantry. Live the life that I've designed for you. Don't crawl back into this life separated from your life source. Don't re, um, rebuild the wall, the plexiglass that is between you and God. Invite his vibrancy into these different areas. So here's how I wanted to actually end today. Uh, again, if you have your phones, write this down or take a picture, or if you just wanna jot this down, I really would encourage this because um, this next week, if we're gonna have this Awaco sleeper, stop pain in the pantry week, where we're like, hey, I don't wanna be sleepwalking. Uh, I, I wanna be alert. Uh, I don't wanna be chasing what feels good. Then I'll tell you who knows the right path. It's God. I, I don't, sometimes I even think I know the right path and then God will lead us a different way. I'll be like, okay, you're right, I'm bringing myself in. So how do we invite God into this? What the Bible says is that we are supposed to meditate on God's word. Here's what that means. It doesn't mean, oh. meditate on God's word means that you get a verse that is in your head and you replay that verse a thousand times throughout the day. Eventually, it's not the words anymore. Eventually, those words actually take root inside of your heart. They take root inside of your soul. They are the filter that you are using as your life. So we are going to memorize a verse. How does that sound, huh? Maybe for some of us, this is our first verse to ever memorize, and that's awesome. But if you memorize this, find yourself saying this almost as a prayer to God in this next week. And if you say this, let's just say 10 times over the course of a day, my guess is that you will eliminate the areas that you are not alert or sleepwalking. So here it is, Psalm 25.5. 
Would you guys read this out loud with me really quickly? Ready? Guide me in your truth and teach me, for you are God, my Savior, and my hope is in you all day long. One more time out loud. Guide me in your truth and teach me, for you are God, my Savior, and my hope is in you all day long. Let's pray. Father, um, I'm just, I'm so good at justifying things. I'm so good at explaining why and giving excuses and reasons. I confess that to you. I don't, I don't want to do that. I don't want to give reasons why I crawl back in the pod. Father, I just want your vibrancy, your salvation to be alive in me. And there's so many areas of my life that I know that I'm, I'm sleepwalking. And first I wanna say thank you for being so kind. Thank you that you died, not just for me to be forgiven, but to feel forgiven for freedom, for vibrancy. And I ask for that vibrancy in every area of my life. And when people see me as a husband, that they can tell that there's something compelling and joyful and connected to you or me as a father or me as a leader or me as an athlete kind of that all that stuff is connected to you. Father, you have a, an intentional next week for every single person in this room. And so we are praying that beautiful verse that, Father, you would guide me in your truth and teach me, for you are God my Savior, and my hope is in you all day long.